Hi, my name is John. I'm a software engineer at Secret Tech. Currently working on developing a gamified to-do list app, Waterdo. I'm fascinated by gamification apps, so I have devoted myself to making gamified applications in both my career and side projects. Today, I'm going to talk about a gamified machine learning application called Testogram. The app was built with the latest TensorFlow APIs released this year. So if you haven't heard about it, TensorFlow is an end-to-end -end open source machine learning platform. It offers an intuitive high-level KRS APIs for building your models easily and quickly. It provides stable Python APIs and embraces the style and ergonomics of the Python language. It allows you to train and deploy your models easily. It's designed to be highly portable, running on a variety of devices and platforms. And TensorFlow 2.9 has been released at the time of this recording, ready for you to try out new and improved features. So TensorFlow makes it easier for beginners and experts to create machine learning models. And while we are excited to hear this, it can also be a little bit scary to learn tons of these APIs. So the goal of this talk is to help developers get familiar with this end-to-end -end platform. And to do so, we are going to build an image assessment application, Testogram, completely from scratch. The app we are building for this talk is actually launched, and you can find it on Google Play. We are building a mobile machine learning app that allows users to get a daily scores of their photos. Whenever you take a photo, you use it to feed your virtual agent, which is an AI model. The AI model will then evaluate the photo based on the lightning, the composition, and the style. After tasting your photo, the model will leave a rating for you. Hope your virtual agent will enjoy the meal you prepared. And here are some examples of how the feature might look like. So for this talk, I'm going to take a somewhat top-down approach and start from the aesthetic data. Here, I'll talk about some useful ways of preprocessing the data sets by using the Keras preprocessing layers APIs. And then we'll move on to building and training the model, where we'll get to understand a little bit about how to apply the transfer learning to learn an image assessment task. Finally, we'll tie all of these pieces together at the bottom level and talk a bit about deploying the model on edge devices. So we start by talking about the data. We'll talk about data preprocessing for machine learning and how the Keras API can make it easier for you. When it comes to machine learning, a lot of our academic focus is placed on model architecture and hyperparameter tuning. But when you actually look into the code that's written, this part is for the model. And this is for the preprocessing of data. So why do we need to preprocess the data? There are two major use cases for data preprocessing. The first one is what's called data factorization. The reason is because neural networks can only process numerical values. And further, it's usually a good idea to normalize the scale of the numerical inputs to restrict them to small values, typically in the range from 0 to 1. The second use case is data augmentation. Data augmentation is mainly used when processing images. The idea is to gen generate random variations of an incoming image on the fly so as to expose your model to a greater diversity of inputs during training. It's a great strategy for small data sets, and you can train models to generalize better to new images. There's a key challenge with data processing, which is known as training serving skew. Machine learning models can only make sense of inputs that stay very close to what they have seen before. For this reason, it's very important that the preprocessing setup that you are using stays very close between training and production. For instance, if you deploy an image classification model on a mobile app, you need to make sure to use the same resize and normalize system applied at training time. This can be very challenging. Any small discrepancy can have a large impact on real-world performance. And this is something that Google researchers have observed with production in their systems. Training serving skew is a very difficult and important challenge. The Keras preprocessing layers APIs are designed to address this challenge. Keras preprocessing layers are modular building blocks that encapsulate common preprocessing steps, such as resizing, rescaling, random cropping, and so on. The API enables you to place preprocessing computation either in your data pipeline or directly into your model. 
This means that you can create end-to-end -end models that are capable of processing raw inputs, such as image or text. And these models can be deployed as it is. In this way, you don't have to implement your own preprocessing logic when you deploy in new environments. Because the preprocessing logic is part of the model itself, you are guaranteed that you are using the same logic in production as what you use during training. We will dive deeper into this feature in the model building session. To be concrete, we step back to our example. First, we we'll retrieve the data set called the Adaptive Ratings from Online Data, ARD. And we look at our data. The data set contains photos downloaded from the Flickr website. Each image file contains metadata, such as the number of views of the image and the number of favorites of the image. We can derive the adaptive score of the image as our label by using the metadata. We are going to utilize the ARD datasets for supervised learning. Here, we'll preprocess the datasets to derive the label and features as our training examples. And then we'll talk about how to achieve a better, a better data performance with the TF Data API. And we start by deriving the label. We take the number of favorites and the number of views of an image and convert the data type into float using NumPy. Then we apply the log scaling to both of them. Then we take the log scale favorites and divide it by the log scale views. By doing this, the score gives an approximation for visual aesthetics according to the ARD research. But we may encounter numerical errors when the log scaling is applied, since log zero is invalid. So we can apply numpy down maximum between one and the value before applying the log scaling. Now we have derived the static score for our label for supervised learning. In addition to the label, features are the values that a supervised model use to make predictions. So we have to reprocess the image as well. This is our workflow to preprocess the image. We start with a TF dataset object. Then we read the files on disk and output decoded images and their cor corresponding scores. Finally, we are able to apply Keras preprocessing layers to turn the decoded images into normalized values. The first step is to apply from tensor slices utility function. Here, we pass in a list of image paths as our training sample and a list of scores as our label. The function will return a TF data, dataset object that outputs images path and records corresponding scores. So we will get a regression dataset. For the second step, we need to read the image files on disk. We take an image path and pass it into the tfil read file function, which is a function that reads the contents of a file. And we start by decoding the image with three channels. The result is the image with the original size on the right. Finally, we need to transform the image into something that can be processed by a neural network. This involves several steps. First, we need to resize each image, since our model only accepts a consistent shape. So we can use the TF Keras layers resizing and pass in the width and height. This tells Keras to resize images at the target width and height. Next, in order to prevent overfitting issues, we can apply a random crop to the image. Then we apply data augmentation by random flipping the image horizontally. Finally, we standardize the RGB channel values since our model accepts pixel values to be in the range from minus one to one. As you can see, once the layer is finished the preprocessing, it's capable of turning an image into a flow 32 tensor, which encodes the entire image. We can then define a Python function to perform the preprocessing layers on the pair's training examples. Keras makes this entire process easy with the preprocessing layer. It offers a range of common options for image processing, including different ways to customize the normalization step and the cropping step and different ways to resize images. So you can see here that all of the preprocessing that we just applied was through the sequential model here. The sequential model is a stack of Keras layers where each layer has exactly one input tensor and one output tensor. You can think of a sequential model as a chain of transformations to apply to a given tensor. In this case, there's resizing, random crop, and rescaling. And the order of these matters so here we apply the resizing and then the random crop. 
And you can see that the size of the image has been reduced before applied random cropping. So for the sequential model, the order that you read it in code is the same order that it ends up within transformation. In this example, we have applied the sequential chain by using the Keras sequential function, which groups a linear stack of layers into a TF Keras model. Before we start building the model, we have to look into a common issue about the data performance. If we perform preprocessing and training sequentially by proposing one batch of data on CPU and then fitting the batch data to the model that runs on GPU, then the GPU will end up being idle for a lot of time. It will be waiting for the preprocessing pre stage to be done with the data batch before it can start feeding the model. The solution is through preprocessing and training in parallel. TensorFlow is a great API for doing this. We can preprocess our datasets asynchronously on the CPU while the GPU is fed in the pre previous batch. Let's take a look. We can simply take our datasets and apply processing layers using the math function and define how many parallel threads you want to use for the CPU preprocessing. If you were doing it in pure Python without TensorFlow, it would be quite challenging, but TensorFlow solves the problem in a single line of code. So back to our example. Here's our data pipeline for training. First, shuffle the data set to ensure the data order does not cause any issue in training. Next, apply the batch transformation to a given batch size. Then we place preprocessing computation in the data pipeline. We parallelize the data preprocess by using map transformation and set a number of parallel calls arguments. Finally, use a prefetch transformation to overlap the work of a producer and consumer. At this point, we have an efficient data pipeline with the TF Data API, and we are ready to build our model. And now, it's time for the next step, building and training the model. Here, we'll talk about how to apply the transfer learning to learn an image assessment task. Transfer learning is all about taking the knowledge that's already been learned to help learn a different but similar thing. Here, we are going to apply transfer learning based on an image classification model to learn an image evaluation task. We will first load the pre-trained mobile net model to derive an image feature vector. Then define a new regression head for our model to learn a new task. Finally, we are able to train our model to transfer the knowledge from the image classification to the image assessment task. Let's load the pretrained mobile net model, which provides an image feature vector. First, define the URL of the mobile net model from the TF Hub documentation. Next, we can load the model by using hub.keras layer. Here, we pass in the width and height of the input size as the mobile net defined, and the color channels, which in this case is three, as the model accepts RGB images. Finally, we can immediately get the base model, which takes preprocessed input images. Before we continue, we need to make sure the base model works. We can pass in the zero tensor by using tf.0 with a batch size of one. Also, the width and height of the input size that we defined previously. We can then log the resulting shape of a tensor return using result.shape to help us understand the size of the image. After running zeros through the mobile net model, we'll see the shape of the tensor printed. As the first item is just the batch size of one, we can see the model return features that can be used to learn a new task. Now it's time to start defining our model head for learning a regression task. We start by defining the TF Keras sequential model to add our layers. Next, add the mobile net as the input feature to the model followed by a dropout layer to prevent overfitting issues. Then we stack a dense layer on top as the up layer. Here, the number of neurons should be equal to one. Because this is a regression problem, we'll use a sigmoid activation on the up layer, which is commonly used when trying to solve regression problems. At this point, we can print a model summary to the console to ensure everything is correct. Note that we have lots of trainable parameters but a simple density of regular neurons will train pretty fast. We could try applying some modifications to the model architecture to see how it could affect the performance. Often with machine learning, there is some level of trial and error to find the optimal architecture that you give to the model for the best trade-off 
between the speed and resource usage. And finally, we can compile the model and it's ready to be trained. Here, the optimizer is set to RMS prop and the loss will be a mean squared error. Accuracy metrics can also be requested, so they can be monitored in the logs for debugging purpose. In the previous section, we mentioned that you can place the, the preprocessing layers either in the data pipeline, which is great during training, or in the model itself, which is great for inference, since it bypasses the problem of the training serving skew. And here's how it works. For training, we construct a model that takes preprocessed inputs. And for inference, we construct a model that takes raw image inputs. The inference model includes the image preprocessing layer as the first layer in the model. If we want to allow the consumers of the model to perform inference without having to be aware of how each feature is expected to be encoded and normalized, we can place the preprocessing layers to be part of the model. You'll find your inference model will be able to process raw images. And if you want to make your model highly portable and reduce the training serving skew, this is a good convention to follow. The next step is to perform training which is where the transfer learning actually takes place. We can first define a model checkpoint callback to save the weights of the model. Then we call model.fit to train the model. Here, we can now pass in our datasets. Along with some configs, we set the number of epochs to 10. Finally, we pass in the checkpoint callback to save a model checkpoint after each round of training. Now, it's very nice to have a model but our users still need to be able to access the model. Next, we are going to take a look at the deployment options. We have some requirements from our product manager, which should guide our implementation. Let's go through each of them. First, both Android and iOS need to be supported. Second, user privacy is prominent. Photos should never leave users' devices. Third, Processing of photos should happen quickly to ensure a great user experience. And finally, a wide variety of hardware needs to be supported. Current users of the app have devices ranging from less powerful smartphones all the way to high-end smartphones with the latest chips. The first step is to convert a TensorFlow saved model or Keras model to the TensorFlow Lite model format. These models can then be optimized to improve performance. Once the models are optimized, they can be deployed on the mobile application. First, we'll perform the model conversion. We use the Python API to convert the TensorFlow model to the TensorFlow Lite format. We now have a TensorFlow Lite model that can actually run on our mobile devices. Unfortunately, a test result shows that there is a long latency for the model to run a single inference. Because the amount of computation required is still quite large for a Flow32 tensor, for, for a Flow32 TensorFlow Lite model under a real time scenario. In addition, the model size is quite large, which increases our app size. We realized that the TensorFlow Lite model needs to be optimized for mobile to make it run faster and also reduce its size to prevent application bloat. So, we will now talk about model optimization. We now need to tune the model to run efficiently. This is a key step when preparing a custom model for production. So how can we optimize the model? TensorFlow Model Optimization Toolkit provides techniques such as quantization, which lead to smaller models with more efficient computes. This is really important for on-device use cases, like mobile, that inherently have limitations on resources, such as computes, memory, and battery. However, Models that are optimized for size or latency will lose a small amount of accuracy. So it's important for developers to understand the trade-offs to make sense for our use cases. One technique that the Model Optimization Toolkit provides is post-training quantization. As the name implies, it's applied to the model after training. There are a variety of quantization schemes to choose from. As you can see from the code, it's actually quite straightforward to apply quantization. So the converter will apply the chosen optimization technique. However, it's up to the model designer to not only verify the resulting improvements to model size and performance, but also to understand how model accuracy is affected and if the trade-off was indeed worth it based on our requirements. 
Now our model size is smaller, and we are confident that the model will run performantly. And the next step is shipping the features to users on different platforms. We now start to work on deployment, which is the last mile to deliver the features to users. We are now ready to deploy the image assessment model to Android and iOS. For the integration, we can use the TensorFlow Lite Java API for Android, a Swift or Objective-C API for the iOS. The same TensorFlow Lite model can also be used on other devices and services. We can also bring the same image assessment feature to web and other platforms. This ability to create the models that can be deployed across multi-platform is a key benefit of using TensorFlow Lite. It helps developers to leverage the same set of tools and code base for multi-platform deployments. We are now ready to release the feature to users, and let's check the results. First, we turn on the airplane mode to ensure our app works under the offline situation. And we open the Android app, press start, and choose the agent. Here, we have agent Sina and agent Dinah. Since different agents are trained to judge different image styles, here we'll choose our agent Sina. She's our photo rating girl. Then we choose a photo to fit our agent. And wait for a few seconds for Sina to taste the photo. And we got a score and some comments from our agent Sina. Vivid colors are impressive. Cool. And we can try more photos for our agents to test the results. This time, we choose Dinah. She is Sina's twin sister. And we pick another photo. Actually, it only takes a few milliseconds for the model to run a single inference on the mobile CPU. I really like the light in this photo. Yeah. Let's try out more photos. This time, we'll choose this one. But here, we delay the results on the UI on purpose to create a tension while users are waiting for the outcome. Composition is great, but the details in dark areas are not clear. Hmm. Tessagram has been launched, and you can find it on Google Play. And that's it. It's really exciting for me to see the entire machine learning pipeline working like this. TensorFlow makes the entire machine learning pipeline easier for developers. So when building machine learning applications with TensorFlow, you can use Keras preprocessing layers in data pipeline or as part of the model to bypass the training serving skew problem. You can also obtain the base model from TensorFlow Hub to generate image features. You can then train a new prediction head with transfer learning. You can convert and optimize the model and deploy the model to deliver the features to users. So in this talk, we went into depth about how an image assessment application like Tensorgram works. Tensorgram is an app which leverages the TensorFlow ecosystem and Python APIs to serve the entire pipeline, all the way from data to enjoyable experiences in user hands. Developing a gamified app like Tensorgram has been an inspiring journey for me and I feel lucky to do what I'm passionate about in my current company, Secret Tech, which allows me to continue working on gamification apps. In addition to the Testagram app, there are several publications and API reference documents for you to check out. Lastly, we encourage you to keep the conversation going with us. If you have any questions about a talk, or if you want to understand more about our company, Secret Tech, please feel free to contact us by scanning the QR code. I look forward to sharing more interesting topics and practical experiences with you in the future. Thanks for having me today.